yeah welcome back and we will continue from where we stopped um we were looking at mark chapter 16 verses 9 to 14 uh, we looked at how jesus was uh, you know um angry with them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe is what it says in mark uh, 16 verse 14 so um here in uh, coming back to our gospel of john chapter 20 uh, he shows them his hands and his side so that at least now they will you know look at the um, marks of the torture and the you know uh, the 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 stabbing and all which was done uh, you know where where the soldier pierces him in the side uh, you know uh, so all of that uh, so Jesus shows them that so that at least now they would be willing to believe in him. So we see that even though he, in his resurrected body, he, his face looks different. They are unable to recognize him. However, in his resurrected body, he has chosen to retain the marks of the crucifixion. Uh, so um, the, you know, the, the, when the when the sword was uh, pierced into his side after his death uh, that he still has retained that uh, and then even the piercings on his you know, wrists uh, where the spikes the nail spikes would have been you know, uh, put in uh, that also he has retained in his resurrected body uh, because I think they would be like the marks you know of what he has done of the atoning sacrifice which he has done so every time the father looks at that it would be a reminder that uh, yeah, Jesus has finished atoning on our behalf. Uh, so uh, he has retained those things in his resurrected body. So here the disciples are overjoyed when they see that it is indeed the Lord Jesus. And then again, it says in verse 21, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. And then he says, as the father has sent me, I am sending you. So, um, so that he can send them, so that he can equip them for sending. Uh, he now breathes upon them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he adds some wording over there in verse 23. He says, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Um, so let's first look at the um portion where he talks about um you know where it where it says that he breathed upon them um if you were to you know uh, remember the genesis account over there uh, jesus breathes into the clay uh, you know the the clay shape of a human which he has made and then after jesus only after god breathes into uh, that clay uh, shape it becomes human it becomes a man so life is breathed into adam in genesis in the same way here jesus is now breathing upon these disciples and so now they are born again you know so their spiritual birth their rebirth is now uh, taking place here because jesus had said to nicodemus unless you are born again you cannot even enter into the kingdom so now when jesus breathes upon these disciples and they receive the holy spirit they are now birthed in the spirit they are now born in the spirit so uh, there's a there's a parallel between the first breathing where adam uh, became physically uh, alive and now here you see the disciples becoming spiritually alive. Of course, when Adam was created, he was he was both spiritually and physically alive. And then due to the sin, due to the fall, he became spiritually dead. Uh, but over here, the disciples are physically alive and spiritually dead. But now when Jesus breathes upon them and they receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit births them once again. And now they become spiritually alive. So we see a work of uh, recreation taking place over here through that act of breathing, which D Jesus does upon them. And so now that they have become reborn, now that they are born again in the spirit, now he says, you have a fresh role to play. 
So now he's going to be sending them out in the same way that the father sent him. He is now going to be sending them. And now in their new role, they are supposed to forgive sins. And it does not quite make sense to us, right? It says over here, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And basically, the Catholics base their uh, entire uh, you know, ritual of the confession, confessional upon this. So they, they say that the 12, uh, the 11, the 11 disciples and also all the Catholic priests who came along after that, they all have been authorized by God to forgive people's sins. So that is the way they interpret this particular verse. But when you look at um, you know, what has been taught by God to the Israelites uh, from the beginning, uh, it has always been very made very clear that only God has the authority to forgive sins, not humans. Uh, in fact, we see the uh, Jewish leaders referring to this. Uh, that would be in Mark chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. If someone could read out for us Mark chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, please. Mark chapter 2, verse 5 to 7. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to them, Paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven, forgiven you. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemous like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Okay, so it's been made very, very clear to the Israelite community from the very beginning. Only God has the authority to forgive sins. People do not have the authority to forgive sins. So over here, when Jesus is saying to the disciples, uh, those you forgive will be forgiven, uh, what, is, what, is, what is he referring to? So how we should understand this is in the sense of we have been sent out as Christ's ambassadors to preach this gospel of you know uh, reconciliation and forgiveness. So um, to understand this, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. Okay, this is basically what Jesus is talking about. This is what we have been sent out to do. This is the commission which has been given to us. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20, if someone could read out. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their passes to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation now then we are ambassadors of christ as though god were pleading through us we implore you on christ's behalf be reconciled to god and so we see over here that god did not count people's sins against them. He reconciled them to himself through Jesus Christ. So God reconciled people to himself through the work which Jesus did on the cross. And now that same uh, ministry has been given to us. So in verse 20, it says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So now through us, God is making his appeal to people and saying, will you come to me? Will you repent so that I may forgive you your sins? And so we as ambassadors of Christ go out into the world and share with people this gospel of forgiveness, where if a person is willing to repent, then God will forgive them and make them part of his family. And then their entire status will change. And then they will be able to live in a new whole new way. You know, so... Um, in that sense, uh, the, the, the sent out ones from now on, they would be forgiving people's sins. So it's not we, the believers who go out and start forgiving people's sins. We go as ambassadors of Christ, preaching this gospel of reconciliation, 
telling people that god is willing to forgive them and reconcile them to himself and are they willing to accept this great privilege because if they are willing to accept it then he will make them part of his family and then you know they'll be able to live in a whole new way in victory in righteousness so that is the mission which is given to us so technically um human priests do not have the authority to forgive it depends on that person and his heart and whether he has actually repented or not so depending on whether he has genuinely repented of his sins and depending on whether he has accepted jesus as lord and savior so that you know the blood of uh, can work on his behalf depending on that a person sins either stand forgiven or not forgiven a human being cannot just uh, you know speak upon uh, over a person and say your sins are forgiven that will not do it's the blood of jesus which forgives which cleanses and then, and then it's it's that repentance in that person's heart which makes the work of christ applicable so a human can't just speak over another person and say you know your sins are forgiven and that person sins automatically get forgiven that is not what is talked about over here in uh, verse 23 okay so Uh, moving on from there um let's go to the next portion about thomas because when this particular encounter happens on this evening uh, you know on the evening of the resurrection day um thomas is not with the other disciples so jesus comes back once again uh, just to give him uh, proof uh, because you know with after um um after having listened to all the eyewitness reports the disciples still refused to believe so jesus scolded them and he showed them the marks of his crucifixion then they believed and there is still one sheep which is still not believing so for his sake jesus comes back again a second time to these people and uh, that is what we see in verse 24 onwards uh, so if we could have someone read out for us verses 24 to 29 please Now Thomas called the twin one of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came the other disciples therefore said to him we have seen the lord so he said to them unless i see in his hand the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side i will not believe and after 8 days his disciples were again in the and thomas with them jesus came the door being shut and stood in the midst and said peace to you then he said to thomas reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side do not be unbelieving but believing and thomas answered and said to him my lord my god jesus said to him thomas because you have seen me you have believed blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed yeah so um so thomas says you know i literally have to put my finger into that you know um, into that gap which was formed when the nails were you know spiked in so he says i am going to put my finger in only then i will believe uh so for his sake jesus comes back to the place where they have where they are gathered and again the doors are locked jesus literally comes in through the wall and he declares and says peace be with you and uh, now this is enough for thomas he does not put you no know, uh, take his finger and literally poke it into the palm of jesus he does not do all of that he just um simply now says my lord and my god and he finally believes Uh, so then jesus makes this statement he says because you have seen me you have believed blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed which you know refers to all of us in this class i mean there's a blessing resting upon our heads none of us actually saw those pierced hands none of us has, none of us have seen that pierced side and yet because of what is written in the bible we have chosen to believe so there's a blessing which which is resting upon our heads because of this you know faith which we have expressed in jesus 
so that's a that's a blessing you know which is there upon us it's a privilege which we have which thomas did not have um so then in verse 30 um it says um yeah verses 30 and 31 yeah if you could just read out 30 and 31 and truly jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book but these are written that you may believe that jesus is the christ the son of god and that believing you may have the life in him yeah so um we had uh, talked about this in the introduction how probably chapter 20 was supposed to be the conclusion and then later probably the lord also asked him to write one more chapter and so then you know later he would have written chapter 21 and we talked about how there are many many manuscripts available where it where the book ends with just chapter 20 so probably those were the first hand written copies which came out and then later under the inspiration of the holy spirit uh, john adds one more additional chapter and so there's an additional conclusion given later uh, because here it looks like as if the book is now finishing because now the you know the the wording it says over here these few things which have been written down recorded in this book they have been given so that you may believe so basically this written record is for people who didn't get to actually see the way thomas saw thomas saw and he believed but then the rest of us we read about it the words have been put down in writing for us to read and place our faith so this recorded words have been written that you may believe that jesus is the messiah so these words have been recorded and written down for on our behalf so that by believing you may have life in his name so every one of us who has believed now we have life in his name we literally have the zoe life in us because of uh, because we have placed our faith in him so uh, like we had talked about in the introduction the additional chapter was probably added because there were some wrong ideas and thoughts going around and so uh, the lord you know wanted those things clarified and so maybe chapter 21 was written at a slightly later time um you know to include these additional details as well so what was so important what additional things needed to be talked about in this additional chapter you know so we will be looking at those important things uh, now in the time that is remaining and if we are unable to finish we know we'll continue in the next class uh, so coming to chapter 21 uh, if we could maybe have someone read out for us the first um five verses yeah if someone could read out verses 1 to 5 john john chapter 21 later jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the sea of galilee this is how it happened several of the disciples were there simon peter thomas nicknamed the twin nathaniel from the cana in galilee the son of zebedee and two other disciples Simon said Simon Peter said I am going fishing we will come to this they all said so they went out in the boat but they caught nothing all night at dawn Jesus was standing on the beach but the disciples couldn't see who he was he called out fellows have you caught any fish no they replied then he said throw your net on the right hand side of the boat and you will get some so they did, so they did and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it yeah yeah okay so um uh, we see that uh, peter says i am going to go and fish and this a uh, lot of condemnation that is you know um, um heaped upon peter for having said this but um we see that throughout the three years when jesus was with the disciples they continue to earn their livelihood i mean um, they didn't just simply you know wait upon people to come and um, give them funds and contributions so even during the time that they were with jesus you know they were ministering along with him traveling with him uh, going from town to town uh, but whenever possible they did continue to earn their livelihood so that's basically what peter is doing over here is not turned his back on god you know he's not turned his back on 
uh, the higher purpose which God has for his life. He's just um, continuing to do the things which need to be done, you know, because fulfilling his earthly responsibilities. So he says that he will go fishing and the others agree to go along with him and they're not doing anything wrong over here. And um, on this particular night, they're unable to catch fish and Jesus who's standing on the shore tells them to cast their net on the other side. And just like in the earlier cases, you know, they are able to catch a whole bunch of fish because Jesus spoke and gave them an instruction. So they connect two and two together and then they realize that, oh, this is definitely Jesus who is standing over there on the shore. And uh, then you have, um, yeah, in verse 7 it says, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And then Simon Peter immediately, you know, uh, jumps out into the water and swims to the shore uh, to meet with Jesus. Uh, so um, this is how this uh, you know encounter between Jesus and the disciples takes place. And then you have the conversation which uh, happens between Jesus and Peter. So that's basically what we want to uh, touch upon. That would be verse 15 onwards. Uh, so if we could have um, someone read out for us, uh, John chapter 21, Verses 15 to 17. Yeah, 15 to 17. John chapter 21, verses 15. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lamb, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, Simon son of Jonah, do you love me? Yes, Lord Peter said, and you know, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Third time he asked him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Yeah. So here, um, they, I mean, they all sit together. You know, they've, they, they've caught a lot of fish. So then uh, Jesus helps them in frying the fish and they all sit down to eat. Uh, and then after they had eaten the breakfast, that's when Jesus starts a conversation with Peter. And he says to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? So here Jesus is just basically asking him, what are your priorities? You know, uh, you are fishing, you know, you are earning your livelihood. But do you love me more than these earthly things? Yes, there are responsibilities to be fulfilled. But am I still your first priority? That's basically what Jesus is asking him over here. Uh, so uh, very confidently, Peter replies and says, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So um, he's basically saying, Lord, you know that my priority, my first priority is still you. You know, so he admits that. And then uh, Jesus says to him, feed my lambs. Uh, so then again, Jesus asks him a second time, do you love me? So we see that um, there are two different words for love which are being used over here in the original Greek. And there's a lot of misunderstanding regarding this whole issue. So we will look into this. Okay, so um, the first time that Jesus asks the question, um, he asks him, uh, do you? agape me okay and the second time also when jesus asks the question he asks him um, uh, do you agape me the third time that when jesus asks the question he uses the word phileo and he says do you phileo me so the first two times jesus asks using the word agape the third time jesus uses the word phileo and all the three times when Peter re replies and responds, he uses the word phileo. So the first time when Jesus says, do you agape me? He replies and says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. The second time also he says, you know that I phileo you. And the third time, you know, Jesus also uses the word phileo. And you have Peter also replying with the word phileo. Okay, so... Um, and the and in response to what Peter is saying, you know, Jesus asks him to feed his lambs, feed his sheep. 
and also tend to his sheep. So um, the words which are used over there for feeding and for tending, um, this is how um, you know one of the early uh, leaders of the church, one of the early leaders, Philo, a person named Philo, in his writings, this is how he um, you know interprets these two words. He says that the feeding refers to spiritual nourishment. Um, so as a leader of the church, Peter would need to spiritually nourish the believers. And then when it comes to the word tend, which is used over there, the Greek word, it's more to do with leading, leadership, uh, authority, governing, you know, so in that sense. So Peter and all the others who will be serving as leaders of the church, they have two main responsibilities. One will be to spiritually nourish the people, provide them with spiritual food, help them to grow in God, help them to start becoming more and more like Christ, and also to uh, you know, begin their mission of going out and sharing the gospel. So they would nourish the people spiritually to be able to do this. Second, they would also need to lead them, govern them, you know, uh, take care of uh, um, the entire logistics of, 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 the, of the church group, um, you know, take care of the ministry that they are doing. So there's also a kind of administrative and leadership role which would be played. So Jesus never said to Peter, yeah, yeah, you know, you're bluffing. I know you don't really love me. He doesn't say that. So when Peter very confidently says to him, you know that I love you, Jesus takes him at his word, believes what he is saying and says, okay, good. If you love me, then in that case, you please do this. You feed my lambs, uh, you feed my sheep, which are the older, you know, the older sheep, the lambs are the younger sheep. And he also says, tend my sheep, govern them, lead them, uh, you know, uh, look after them. So um, the um, wrong belief that is there is that somehow phileo is a lower, inferior kind of love and that agape is somehow a superior kind of love. And uh, that is a very wrong interpretation that is generally given regarding this passage. Um, now, Greek is a language which was being spoken in the time of Jesus. Um, the people still did use Aramaic in their homes. You know, Aramaic is a kind of, uh, kind of similar to Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew by now was not really being spoken in people's houses. Um, Hebrew was mainly reserved as this kind of you know, uh, religious language because that is basically they, their scriptures were written in Hebrew. So people would still learn how to read Hebrew and they would understand Hebrew. But when it came to just talking between uh, among themselves, most of the Jewish people used Aramaic. That is basically what they were comfortable with. And uh, officially, when they're interacting with the other Gentile people, uh, they would be talking in Greek. So in the Greek language which existed in those days, these um, words, these uh, Greek words, agape, phileo, and eros, um, these three words for love, um, there was no real great um, difference between the words. Yes, eros, of course, was meant for sexual love. But then the other two words, agape and phileo, are just basically your general words for love. It's not like as if one word was more superior and the other, you know, less superior. That was not the case. Um, so a person could say that he phileo somebody, and then he would, if he, if, if he were to say that he agape somebody, it would mean almost the same thing. He's expressing his love. Um, it's just that phileo is more an emotional word. Agape is more... Uh, um, not an overly affectionate word, okay, in that sense. So apart from that, there was no real difference at that time in those days uh, in the usage of agape and uh, phileo. So in fact, on in, uh, in in certain places, you know, in certain written uh, writings, even the words eros and agape are um, are interchanged because 
agape was just a synonym another way of you know saying the word love like in english you know you have love you have affection um uh, you may also have you know um you know a, 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 a sense of endearment these are all just synonyms talking about love in different words in different ways now when did agape start gaining a special significance um in those days when it came to written uh, written writings the word agape was used to place emphasis on the object that was being loved okay so when it came to the to written writings agape was used in a slightly technical manner where whenever that word agape was used the emphasis is on the object which is being loved let's use a simple example if i were to say that i fillet your ice cream i'm basically saying that i love ice cream on the other hand if i say i agape ice cream the emphasis is on the object which i love i'm emphasizing the fact that ice cream is very important to me it is something very special to me so that word agape was used to emphasize the object that was being loved and so the gospel writers when they began to write and you know even uh, paul began to write his letters and peter wrote his letters they began to use this word agape in a slightly more significant manner to bring out the emphasis on the object which is being loved um so let's look at two examples john chapter 12 verses 42 and 43 if someone could actually read out this john 12 42 and 43 john John twelve forty two and forty three. Uh, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. The word used over there is agape. For they agape human praise more than praise from. god what did they agape they agaped human praise they loved it it was very important to them more than god's praise human praise was more important to them they agaped it they loved it the emphasis is on the object which they love um in the same way second timothy chapter 4 verse 10 second timothy chapter 4 verse 10 and was then for for dames has forsaken me having loved this present world and has departed for thessalonica christians for galatia titus for the Dal, dalmatia yeah i mean yeah those names are not important the point is that demas he agaped this world so the emphasis is on the object which he is loving the world he loves the world so much that he actually abandoned jesus and went back into the world which he loves so much so that word agape began to be used to emphasize the object which is being loved and so because god loved sinful humans who you know who don't even deserve to be loved gospel writers began to use this word agape to talk about how god loves humans who don't even deserve love so in that sense agape began to be used to uh, to talk about god's love for for people who don't even uh, deserve the love and affection of the lord um and uh, and so the word also began to be used for um any any commandment where people are being asked to place uh 
uh, people are being commanded to express love towards the object you know uh, that they are supposed to love okay well, let, let me just use a verse and explain that ephesians 5:25 yeah if someone could read out ephesians 5:25 Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave, gave himself for it. Yeah, so here it says, husbands, agape your wives. Okay, so the emphasis is on the object which is being loved. The husbands are being told, rather than you know focusing upon yourselves, focus your, your attention on your wife love her how in the same way that christ has agape the church you know christ has he 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 put all of his own interests aside and he took the interests of the church into consideration in the same way you know uh, the husbands are commanded to make their wives the object of their love where the emphasis is on the object which is being loved and cherished and so in John 14, 23, Jesus says, If anyone agape me, he will keep my word. And uh, so Jesus is telling, you know, if, a, if, a, if you call yourself a disciple of mine, then you should be agaping me. Your entire emphasis should be on me. I should be the main focus of your love and commitment and loyalty. So, in biblical writings, the word agape began to gain some special significance where you don't base your love on emotions and feelings. Sometimes you may, you may be feeling very emotionally loving, but there may be other times when you're not, you're not feeling any emotion, but you continue to love as an act of will. So, when husbands are commanded to agape their wives, it's not like as if they're going to agape their, their wives only when they are emotionally feeling very loving. It's an act of will, where you make a choice that I will love my wife, whether I'm feeling like it or not. So, in the same way, Jesus commands and he says, if anyone agape me, he will keep my word. You don't keep his word only, only, only on the days when you feel like it. Whether you feel like it or not, you make an act of will and you say, I will honor him by obeying him. So, agape is not a very emotional word. It is a word where you make a conscious choice and say, I will focus on this object that I have chosen to love and I will do it as a commitment. Okay, so um, it gained all of this emphasis through the biblical writings. Before that, that word agape, in fact, did not have any, any special significance at all. Phileo, on the other hand, is all about tender affection. It's a very emotional, it's a deeply emotional word. It's a word which was used uh, to talk about, um, you know, uh, overtly, you know, uh, expressions of love, where you, where you literally are feeling love for someone. So when uh, the, the sisters, you know, uh, Lazarus' sisters sent him a message saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick, they used the word phileo. Because Jesus had a very emotional attachment towards Lazarus. So over there, the word which is used is, the one whom you phileo, he is sick. That is in John chapter 11, verse 3. And that word is also used... Uh, for the father showing love for the son. You know, it's an emotional love that is being talked about in John 5.20, uh, where it says, for the father phileo the son and shows him all things. So the father has an agape love towards the son, but he also has a very emotional phileo, tender affection towards his son. And... Uh, uh, and then Jesus, when he's talking to the disciples in John chapter 16, he says, for the father himself, you know, he say, you know, because in John chapter 16, Jesus says, no longer do I have to pray on your behalf. You can directly go to the father and ask him because the father, he phileo you. He has this tender affection towards you. So, you know, um, 
Phileo is in no way an inferior word. It's, it's, an, it's an unequal footing with agape. Agape and phileo are... So when, you know, the three times when Peter says, Lord, you know, I phileo you, that guy is putting all his emotion into that word and is saying, Lord, I have deep affection towards you and you know it. So in, in no way is it an inferior word that is being um, used, okay? So um, the whole problem uh, of this kind of categorization of agape and uh, phileo, that happened because of a mistake which C.S. Lewis made. C.S. Lewis in 1960, he came out with a book called The Four Loves. And in that, he gave his definition of these four words and that is how the whole misconception came. Okay, so he's the one who said that agape is the unconditional love of God. And he's the one who said that phileo is a brotherly love. But then, even if you look at the, uh, the you know, the, the Greek dictionaries, you know, which have been, uh, the biblical di Greek dictionaries which have been written, he went against what was written in the Greek dictionaries. I mean, the Greek dictionaries... Uh, the, the Bible the Greek dictionaries have been written to uh, explain biblical uh, words uh, in a very clear manner. And they have been written by scholars who have spent their entire lifetime studying the Greek uh, language of Jesus' times. And uh, C.S. Lewis did not bother to follow any of those dictionaries when he came out with this book. So it is a mistake which he made. Okay, so uh, just based on what C.S. Lewis has said, we don't have to be misled in our understanding of these uh, words regarding love. And it's also maybe good to note that no human being is perfect. So we should be careful whenever we are looking into the teachings of any person. Because C.S. Lewis had some, has some very strange ideas on the inspiration of the word of God. It almost sounds sometimes in his writings like whether he, he doesn't really believe that all portions of the Bible are inspired. So just because a person is a big name and a popular name, let's not accept everything that they say. Let's be careful, you know, um, careful in the teachings which we take from different people. Uh, so coming to our verse 17, John chapter 21, verse 17. Um, Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you phileo me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? So Peter is not feeling grieved because Jesus has used the word phileo. Peter is feeling grieved because Jesus is saying that to him for the third time. And this would have been a reminder to him about how he had denied Jesus three times. And uh, uh, so he's grieved, he's hurt. And this is what he replies to Jesus. And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. So, Lord, you know, I mean, you know everything. So if you look into my heart, you will automatically see whether I actually genuinely phileo you or not. So you know it for a fact. So why did Jesus do this? I mean, this is, uh, this is something which has troubled me very deeply. I've always wondered because, you know, um, we've always been told that when, when God forgives, you know, he does not hold our sin against us anymore. He no longer holds a grudge. Once he forgives, he forgives. So why did Jesus deliberately bring up this topic and rub it into Peter, you know, till, till, till Peter actually feels hurt? Why did God do this? Why would Jesus do this? So this is something which I really needed to understand. You know, um, if we were to look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. Um, yeah, if someone could, um, you know, read out that for us. Hebrews 8, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. You know, it's so clear. I will never again remember their sins. This is actually a quotation from Jeremiah 31, 34. Okay, so, um, so if this is how God treats us, then why did Jesus do this to Peter? 
And if Jesus did this to Peter, is he doing that to every one of us? So you see, that is why I needed to know. I need to needed to understand the uh, this in the correct perspective. Um, so we have basically five minutes left. Um, we will, you know, try to uh, cover whatever we can today, uh, and then you know continue on in the next class. Uh, so immediately after this, you know, immediately after this verse where Peter says, and he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. That would be verse 17. And then verse 18, this is what is said over there. So, you know, if we could uh, maybe read out verses 18 and 19. If someone could read out. Uh, John 21, 18 and 19. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify G God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Okay, so Jesus is in, is in no way doubting Peter's love. Peter says, Lord, you know all things. And Jesus, you know, in fact, says, yes, I know all things. In fact, I'll tell you exactly in what way you're going to love me. A day will come when you will stretch out your hands and other people will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. So Jesus is not doubting even for a moment Peter's love. In fact, it's Peter who's not understanding that, you know, uh, he is completely forgiven. Maybe Peter is still going on dwelling on the past. So Jesus is raising this question, not because Jesus has any doubt. Jesus wants is raising the question to help Peter know that he can leave this behind. He no longer has to dwell on it. So Jesus, in fact, says to him, yes, I do know all things. And in fact, I, I know how much you love me. I know how you are going to be martyred for me in the future. So I know to what extent you love me. But Peter, do you know that? Do you realize that you're going on dwelling on that past mistake? You're going on, you know, poking yourself and condemning yourself for that mistake. Why don't you leave it behind? Because you know, you have been forgiven and now you're moving on and I truly believe that you love me and which is why I've, I've told you that you should feed my sheep. I've committed my sheep into your hands. So Jesus never had any doubts about Peter's love. It was Peter who was unable to move on from his failure. And the beautiful thing that we see is that in the next verse, it says, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. And you discover that this entire conversation which happened between Jesus and Peter did not happen in front of everyone. It, Jesus took Peter and they were walking together alone, just the two of them, when Jesus had this entire conversation. Jesus did not humiliate him in front of everyone else. They were walking together on the beach. And John was following some way behind. So Jesus takes him away privately and brings up this topic deliberately to heal him on the inside, to give him this confidence that no matter what happened in the past, it is now forgiven. And now God is completely trusting him and entrusting his sheep into his hands. And so now Peter needs to move on rather than continue to hold on to the past. So there's a beautiful message of forgiveness which is being taught over here in this passage. So after this conversation is done, Peter turns around and he sees the disciple following, you know, the, the disciple whom Jesus loves, that is John. And then he asks, what about um, John? Uh, you know, he says, uh, Lord, what about him? Okay, we'll, we'll cover those things, you know, in our next class. Uh, but the point that I wanted to emphasize is that Jesus takes him away privately and they have this conversation together privately. It's not done in front of the others. There's no desire on Jesus' part to humiliate him. Jesus wanted to heal him, build up his confidence, 
help him to move on and become the leader that he is meant to be so that is god's approach towards us when we sin and we repent he will not remember our sins anymore but he expects us also to stop dwelling on those sins and going on condemning ourselves with those sins he wants us to realize that he has accepted our repentance and he wants us to realize that he now believes in our love for him he wants us to realize that he now has confidence in us and so like peter we are expected to move on and take on the roles which he has waiting for us you know in his kingdom in his ministry okay so these are some of the truths which we could you know uh, dwell upon in our class today and in this particular phrase which is used over here you know where, where jesus says to peter you will stretch out your hands and they will take you the term stretch out your hands it was referring to uh, the crucifixion um okay we'll cover all of that in our next class because we are actually out of time okay sorry yeah we'll close with a word of prayer um lord we just thank you so much for the lessons that we could learn from your word today uh, we pray oh lord uh, that we will walk in the new status which you have given us uh we are now brothers of jesus we are now sisters of jesus you o oh lord are literally our father our heavenly father now and so lord we can come to you with confidence and place our requests before you and lord with your equipping we can go out and take up this ministry of reconciliation which you have entrusted to us so that people o oh lord can be forgiven of their sins and come to you Lord we thank you for all of these things which we have learned today and we pray oh lord that we would apply them in our own lives and in our ministry thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you so much